Oopsie. <clears throat> Hi. Hello, sir. So I broke down and bought the making of Karataka, which is the, they, they, it's just, it's, ex, uh, made exactly like the Atari 50 game slash documentary, but now they call it the Gold Master series, and this one's number one, the Jeff Minter story is number two, but, uh, who's that? Oh, okay. Um, this is like. This was on sale on Steam for like 15 bucks. It's like 20 bucks now. <clears throat> so, and I've never, I never knew the background. It's going to be interesting that I just want to learn. You know. And it's kind of cool that we, you know, I started recently playing this again. series. Oh, be enough to launch me into the video game. Eighteen years old, May fourth. God, almost, almost a uh, like forty-one years. Controller unless to play the game, then then we'll we'll do that. So, <laughs> what was uh, what was uh, what was everybody's Thursday? And by everybody, I just mean Zen because they're the only one here right now. <laughs> <clears throat> It was my Friday. Oh, so is uh, Saturday or Sunday? Or are you just having a three day weekend? Okay, we can avoid going to work in the snow. Gotcha. I gotcha. Oh. All right, so so there will be um, watching and playing, mostly watching, I guess. So, we can have masterpiece. How did a teenager with an Apple II design one of the most influential games of all time? Explore the making of Jordan Me Mechner's Mechner's Mechner's. Karataka below, or view the games with that. Chapter 1, Death Bounce. At first, Jordan Mechner wanted to create an arcade-style shooter. The lessons he learned from its rejections would inspire the creation of Karataka. Okay. Stardom teenage programmer prodigy Jordan Mechner didn't want to wait around to get into the video game industry. Not when he had an Apple II and a dream of striking it rich. He just needed a killer idea. Sounds like my brother. Well, he didn't want to jump into it, but he learned all about computer, but with an Atari computer. 
introduction, playing the movies. In 1984, Border Bund released the debut game of a young developer named Jordan Mechner. Erotica would prove to be one of the most influential games of the era, inspiring a generation of designers with its many groundbreaking leaps in cinematic techniques, animation, story, characters, and music. Alright. Why can't I click on it? Enter play video. So, this is a Media Mate, and it contains a bunch of five and a, uh, and a quarter inch discs. There's a lot of classics here in here, including Wolfenstein and Beyond Castle Wolfenstein, which inspired us later. And just behind that is the game. Karateka. Love it. It's so good. I remember seeing Karateka and wanting it and then uh, not having enough money to buy it. But I think I saved up some money and I eventually went back and got it. I was sold on the box artwork alone. Kind of told a story. I remember the, the illustration was, was really well done. Um, and again, just kind of told a story of what that game was. And um, yeah, eventually I picked it up and started playing it. When I first loaded it up, what I expected was something down the lines of Karate Champ or similar head-to-head -head beat -em ups Instead, what I got was a cinematic experience. That's what blew my mind, right? The fact that it started with, you know, a text crawl, right out of, which to my mind, that was right out of Star Wars, right? That cinematic experience is the thing that was just amazing, right? It was the most movie-like experience I had ever had in a video game at that point. It really felt like, you know, you're a, a karate hero in a movie, you know, that's fantastic. All the other things that feel like bleeps and bloops, and this is like, you know, movie making. It was amazing. Yeah, I was just very impressed by the fluidity of the animation. Um, and uh, the kicks look great. The punches look great. They were always capped off with a little bit of a sound, a little kia. Yeah, the fluidity of the motion, I think, really set the stage for the rest of what I had consumed about that game. The animation was cool and that was very innovative, innovative, obviously at the time. The process and the beginning of animation getting better and better and better, right? And more cinematic. Taking cues from the movie industry. The sound. But I think the story, <laughs> the I, I think the storytelling uh, was probably one of the, just one of the first, I can't think of, I, I can't think of another game at the time that had that element to it. Well, the characters, were not little sets of pixels. They, in fact, were fully formed individuals. They had personalities, they had strengths and weaknesses. You've got to remember the, the level of graphics that people were doing at that time, and they were, they were on the sophisticated side for that time. Karateka was historically a very significant game, and it saw the future before anybody else did. Part of it was because it understood the language of cinema, that visuals mattered, that full motion mattered, that human beings and characters and characterization, and storytelling and music mattered in a way that we take for granted now when we see games, games that are at least as complex as films. And our common knock against a lot of game developers today is that they want to be movie makers, but gosh, you could almost look at Karataka as oh, sort of the the original apple from the tree of knowledge there. It was, it was really in a lot of ways the first game that put together fluidity of motion, cinematic shots, story arc, twists, uh, filmic language, and pointed the way towards a marriage of film, movie style storytelling and gameplay. Cool. I wonder if I unlock stuff. <laughs> Do we go down? Seven. DJ! How you doing, sir? Love your face. Happy Thursday.
Jordan Mechner. Born in 1964, Jordan Mechner quickly developed a love of cartooning, envisioning, envisioning a career in comics. God, it sounds like me. Oh, no. oh nice. <laughs> that all changed when he discovered computers. By 13, he was already contributing math-heavy articles about the Apple II to Creative Computing Magazine with titles like In Search of Pi and Pascal's Triangle. What's it all about? I, I don't have my bot on, but you'll get the audio. <laughs> You've seen it so many times, you picture it in your head. What's up, X? You can zoom in. What's, what does it say there? Good evening, sir. Today I picked up Prince of Persia on, th on 360 for five bucks. Oh, nice. Can't, can't go wrong there. Yeah, the Apple II. <laughs> Apple II. Part of the first wave of home computers sold in 1977, the Apple II's color graphics and ease of use made it an early favorite and the first device that introduced computers into the homes of millions of Americans. This quickly created a mass market of video game software open to any Apple II owner skilled enough to create some. Jordan with two family member friendly friends circa 1979 to an Apple II year when he was 14. Jordan sold his first game to a publisher. The company Soft Tape paid him 25 bucks for his game called Maze, intending to put it in a collection of Apple II games on cassette tape. It does not seem that Maze was ever released. Hairstyles. <laughs> More than anything, 14-year-old Jordan Mechner wanted an Apple II. He saved up the money he made doing caricatures at local fairs to buy one. Once he had his own computer, he immediately started creating games, including a version of a popular arcade game that was almost published. Beatty! Look at this old man. Hey, 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 hey. Ooh, only 8%. Yeah, let's, I'll, I don't say how long this is. Oh. You actually got started when you kept going to the so local dark. arcade and um, you kept borrowing quarters to put in the arcade machine to do. What was it? Star, not Star Wars. Uh, Space Invaders? Uh, no. Asteroids? Uh, asteroids. Yeah. You, you, you were completely addicted to asteroids. You, every day, you couldn't just, you couldn't wait to, to go to the arcade to put some more quarters in that machine <laughs> to play asteroids. And that was 1980, so by then I was already in, in high school. That's pretty embarrassing if I was borrowing quarters <laughs> from you. From everybody. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I gave you the quarters, and um, and then uh, you decided you had to um, program your own asteroids. Why yeah. why leave it to the arcade? <laughs> and you said, I can do this on my computer. You were caricaturing when you were nine years old. The caricaturing, yeah. But you did it because you wanted to use the money to buy an, an Apple computer. The way I remember it, I was uh, 12, 13 years old. I was doing the caricatures. I was doing the... Cookie Magazine, you have my Mad Magazine yeah. parody. And really I wanted to do comics and animated films, but this was before computers came along. So I think if the Apple II hadn't been invented when it was, I probably would have just kept on making comics Okay, but, but you, I remember that you went to those street fairs, to those town fairs, to earn money to buy yourself an Apple computer. Yeah. Um, I know. I didn't know what the money <laughs> oh my was God damn. Before, but uh, at uh, 14. Yeah, but later on, you yeah. you were definitely trying to save up 
the I think you need nine hundred dollars to buy an Apple computer. Yeah, twelve twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. That was the price of a sixteen K so, Apple II. So to to translate that into today's money, you can multiply maybe by six. It's real money. I know it was all the money I had. Yeah. And then even after doing yeah, the caricatures, then you I didn't have from that. Emily yep. to get for the last hundred dollars you bought. If you made money <laughs> doing caricatures so to buy an Apple games. computer, you had so, to be so pretty the good. First one was asteroids. Asteroids was actually. I mean, it took a couple of years to get to that point because my first games were in basic. Yeah, in today's game. market, yeah, uh, uh, back then, it was like, that's Apple equivalent II. to like 6,000 probably. Yeah. You have a kind of a, right. a paddle. It's just, it's very simple. It's a ball bouncing and you try to yes, knock out the yes, blocks. Yes, yes, right. And, uh, and so I would look at these programs written in basic and try to uh, deconstruct how they'd been done. Mm -hmm. And uh, IBM had the Thomas J. Watson Research Center uh, Explorers Program. Once a week, uh, my friend Adrian would drive me uh, after high school oh, yeah. to IBM, and like they would let us kids come in and use the computers after hours. So that's where Seven I first started awesome. learning how to program basic. No word of a lie. You know. I see. And then, uh, and then with the Apple, it had basic, but it also had uh, machine language, which was more of a mystery. It took uh, longer to learn that. Yeah, I remember that uh, you, you you did program asteroids. You worked on that quite a while, and and it was so good such a good replica of asteroids that that a New Jersey company bought it from you. They paid you a lot of money. Well, maybe, I think it was $400. Like that, that was a lot of money. It, it was a lot of money. Too. And it was the first money that I'd earned by programming. It. Yeah. And I was keeping track of it. It was fabulous. And you had a royalty um, position and you thought you would make a lot more money from the royalty. But then they got sued and, and they had to uh, stop the whole thing because because it was too good a replica of asteroids. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. That's that's almost exactly how it happened. But, yeah. Uh, the best-selling Apple yeah. game at that time was Space Invaders, and they sold, you know, I don't know how many, but uh, I figured out that if I could do that for asteroids, yeah, uh, I, you know, that would be my. That was a pretty yeah. good, and you were pretty right. good version. If, if they hadn't gotten sued, you would have. If that been a year earlier, yeah. <laughs> right, that was just about the time that Atari kind of figured out what was going on. And they sent uh, threatening letters to all of the, the game publishers saying, uh -huh. you can't publish copies of our games at the Asteroids. So that was a big letdown. Damn you, Atari. Actually, it, 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 that'd be more like... Uh, <laughs> that would be uh, that'd be Warner Brothers or Warner Communications. Since there were few official Apple II versions of popular arcade games, clones like the one Jordan created could be quite lucrative. Hayden Software, publisher of the popular chess game Sargon, Sargon? Sargon? Gave 16-year-old Jordan a $750 advance and a 15% royalty for his asteroids. His father, Francis, had to go sign the contract. God damn. A lot of people wanted to buy Atari. Turner might have done something with it. Asteroid Blaster design documents. Various design documents for asteroids illustrating how Jordan plotted the game's pixel art on graph paper before transferring the designs to Apple II. <laughs> Letter from Hayden Software, December 1980. Letter from Hayden Software, Stephen Radush to Jordan, dated December 30th, 1980. I was nine. Radish details changes that the publisher would like Jordan to make to the game while expressing hopes that it will be the best asteroid-based game on the market for the Apple and bring it substantial royalties for Jordan. Dang, what's up, Schmed? You were three. I don't think I'm going to read all that, but that's cool. I'll read it later. I have no dicks. Well, hey, that's, that sounds like a you problem. <laughs> oh, there's eight images here. Oh. Oh, okay. It's totally, total asteroid. Yeah, that's, that's lawsuit proof right there. Shit, piss cakes of a dick. Jordan's Asteroid game went through several title changes. First, it was Asteroid Belt, 
By the time of this prototype version in 1981, it was Astro Asteroid Blaster. In this version, the graphics were still highly reminiscent of the arcade game on which it was un unofficially based. Oh, so can we play? Oh, we can play. We can play this. Were these things? Okay, Schmid. Thank you, sir. I get to play. I want to play it. I get to play again. I can watch, watch a playthrough of the game, and take over action anytime. Oh, that's cool. No, I want to try it. God, <laughs> look at this. Oh man. You go on hyperspace? Oh, that, that makes it go. Oh, shit. Oh, there's hyperspace. Oh. <laughs> God damn. Now you gotta think, back then, this was like amazing. Whoa. Oh, shit. The sounds could be better, but, you know. Oh, I suck. <laughs> Game over. Maybe I should have done a watch. <laughs> should have watched along. Didn't die there. Pew pews. I know. Oh, why is it moving so slow? There we go. Start moving. Oh wow! Really? That's a that's a big thrust when you hold it down. To the chopper! Hey, where'd you go? Oh. Ooh, shit. Hey, I shot, I shot him first. And went right through him. Buggy game. <laughs> Unfinished. I'm asking for a refund. Yeah, just like that. God, this game makes that game look good. <laughs> like I said. Oh, oh come on, that wasn't even near me. <laughs> Game over. All right, so that's cool. I dig that. That was that was neat. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> Give me back my bullets. Jordan Mechner, Yale man. In the fall of 1981, when he was 17, Jordan entered Yale University. Wow. I guess so. In New Haven, Connecticut, a few hours train ride away from his family's family home in Chapo Chappaqua, New York. I don't know. There he started taking karate classes and joined the Film Society. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> Wind jammers. I remember there's a place called the Windjammer where I live, and that's where you can buy, like, drug paraphernalia. You know, pipes and stuff to smoke your weed in. Star Blaster. By the end of 1981, 
Hayden still had not published Jordan's game and was requesting that he make further changes to make it less similar to the arcade game on which it was originally based. This included more title changes, first to Space Rocks, then to Star Blaster. That's funny because there's a homebrew Asteroids game called Space Rocks that somebody made. George has been a diversion. No, let me let's 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 move the floppy disk. Okay. Star Blaster. <laughs> so you're fighting asteroids, right? Alright, so this the ship doesn't have a backside to it. <laughs> it removed its ass. I got tons of lives on here. Jesus. A lot faster pace. Whoa. Oh, sh what is that? <laughs> Happy face. <laughs> uh, it's like evil auto. It's like berserk and asteroid. <laughs> Intruder alert. Intruder alert. I shoot it or did it just disappear? <laughs> Lots of asteroids. Oh, look at that one. That one's hauling ass. Jesus. Oh, shit. shit. Oh, oh, oh. oh, now it's an angry skull face. You see that? No. Nah, I ain't doing nothing. Just chilling. Supposed to rain tomorrow and I think Saturday, so. My work is feeding this Olive Garden tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to that. I got my bonus check. Uh, or I'll be getting that tomorrow morning. They call it success share. And, uh, and then we, we always have a success share celebration, so they feed us. Ooh. So tomorrow they're feeding us um, Olive Garden. <laughs> Still in California, they give us like stupid fruit cups. <laughs> right. Enough of this. I'm trying to die, now I can't die. Maybe that's uh, that's. They want to. They want you to be unhealthy. No, no. They want. They want to be cheap bastards. That's it. I gotta. I gotta text one of my friends out there that still works for Home Depot and, and ask them what they got for their celebration. Cause last time they got. I don't know what they got. Like some kind of. Make it like a snow cone or something. <laughs> I laughed and I snapped a picture of my plate. <laughs> He's like, you dick. Like, fuck no way. Oh my God. I mean, you know, to be fair, you know, the, the RDCs, Home Depot RDCs in California or even in Dallas, you know, that's like 500 employees, you know, we're like 25. <laughs> so <laughs> they, can, they can maybe kind of afford that shit, yeah. You know? After Jordan submitted this version of Star Blaster, the publisher suggested even more radical changes, such as redesigning the game so the player does not fire any bullets and only dodges the asteroids. Jordan declined to make such changes. He told them he changed the asteroids to soap bubbles, but nothing more, and Hayden Software never published the game. <laughs> so, whoop. Is that Donkey Kong or the Gingerbread Man? Jordan, the journaler. At the beginning of his second semester at Yale, Jordan began keeping a daily journal. He kept this up all throughout his college career and beyond, meticulously documenting the development of his early Apple II games. Could be a narrator. At the beginning of his second semester at Yale, Jordan began keeping a daily journal. He kept this up all throughout his college career and beyond. 
meticulously documenting the development of his early Apple II games. Please leave your name at the beep. Uh, I had the same kind of hair, dude. About Jordan journals, about this journal. My basic intention is to write down at the end of each day what happened, what I did, thought, felt, and so forth. So I can read it years from now and remember what it was like. Okay. I missed my classes today. Music, pillows, pillows, discussion, groups, sign Shit, what's the matter with me? <laughs> Three game concepts. Having abandoned Star Blaster, Jordan started generating several ideas for original games. Sticking within the arcade shooter genre, his intent was to write three or four games during his first summer break from Yale. Some are detailed here. Plague, Bubble Blaster, and Satellite, later called Earth. Oh my god, I can't read that. Well, I guess I can zoom, right? Oh. I still can't read that shit. <laughs> What? <laughs> How you doing? Welcome on in. We are watching slash playing the making of uh, Karateka. Karateka or Karateka. Doing good? Good. We used to play this game back in the day, and then uh, Digital Eclipse made this uh, interactive documentary, so like I'm going through it. I just picked it up, so that's what we're kind of doing here. Plague screen layout. A more detailed screen layout for Plague. Spiders would descend on webs, snakes would slide down poles, and bats would swoop in, all attempting to reach the player's turn. Got all nightmare fuel for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> icebreaker screen layout another idea icebreaker had the player's ship at the top of the screen avoiding ice speeds and shooting down through a layer of ice to hit the enemy bases on the ocean floor i used to do shit like this i should have made a video game Revenge of the Arcadians. Another unproduced concept was Revenge of the Arcadians, which would have combined many different familiar... Roger, Roger. And it's Roger. Sorry for being late, but I was busy listening to me screaming trees CDs. CDs? I've been playing Skyrim Special Edition on Xbox One. Cool. I like Skyrim. I didn't dive deep in the Skyrim as much as I did Oblivion, but I should have. You know, I beat the main quest and kind of was doing some other side quests. And then other games came out and I just... But I remember Oblivion, I did everything you can possibly do in that game. Even with the DLCs. How you doing, Roger? Combine many different familiar looking enemies from arcade game cultures into a single, astro single asteroid style shooting contest. Well, I see Pac Man and Berserk and asteroids, of course. Oh shit, just a lot of asteroids. Berserk, yeah, Galaxian. Oh, well, he even has a Monaco, Pac Man, Phoenix. Space Invaders, Star Castle, Tempest. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> total Space Invaders. I've got a good thing going here. The Apple is still the number one computer. Arcade games are the number one sellers, and I'm writing Apple II arcade games. So I should churn them out and make pots of money while I can. This summer I'll write three or four. I should establish a working relationship with some other publisher, not Hayden. Serious Broder Broder Bund? Thing in Skyrim except getting married. <laughs> well, I guess that would be the smart move, right? <laughs> Just like real life. 
Enter Death Bounce. In the end, the game that Jordan decided to create next was Death Bounce. Another take on the asteroid genre, this one would feature multicolored bouncing balls that ricochet off the walls of the arena. I got two kids. Well, you know, you don't have to be married to reproduce. Those asteroids with balls. Oh! 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 No, we can play this on here. Death Bounce designs. Death Bounce design documents on graph paper from various stages of production. The spike enemy does not appear in any known prototype of Death Bounce and was likely replaced with the rover. Whatever that means, I guess I'll find out later. Oh, I guess. I knew I was tired, but I'm already having a nightmare. What the fuck? <laughs> Good evening. Did I go through all? Yeah, I did. George's Journal. I got a letter from Doug Carlson at Broderbund. Broder, Broderbund? I, please, I don't know how to pronounce that. Re software submission. I like Broderbund. I'll send them a letter describing bounce. Doug's letter mentioned that they might even pay airfare for programmers to come work for them. Wow. Out in sunny California. Oh man, I want it. I want to so bad. Special edition because it's so much fun. Yeah, Skyrim is fun. All those uh, Moral, not Moral and uh, Elder Scrolls games. I hereby vow no more work on this project until Friday, until psych paper, history paper, psych test, philosophy paper, music are out of the way. Then finish the game during reading period, then a week of exams, and whoops, freshman year will be over and I'll have to pack my stuff and go home. Speedy, have a good night. Are you going in or are you just, just being old man tired? You call me the old man. And only a 21% chance of getting your salad tossed. So. Who the fuck is this Jordan? This is the making of Karataka. Jordan Mechner was the creator. So this is like his, you know. I want to get at least seven hours. I got you. I tried that once with uh, six hours and it didn't work out too well. Well, I'll, I'll show you. I'll go back. Letter to Broadbund, Broad March 1982. I was 11. He near completion of his first version of Death Bounce, Jordan reached out to the publisher Broadbund and to, to gauge its interest. He finished programming on April 28, 1982 and mailed Broad Broadbund a disc on April 29th. All right, cool. See, we're going through all his games first before he came up with Karataka. It's, you know, the title of this game, so. Oh, here we go, we can play Death Bounce. All right. The first version of Death Bounce, April 28th, 1982, implements the elements seen in Jordan's original design on paper. Multicolored balls bounce haphazardly all through the play field plus a large white ball called the Rover, inspired by the 1960s British TV show, The Prisoner. Oh. I am not a number. I'm a free man. There's a game about making it of a, of a game. Yeah, you can tell it's the same as the Atari 50. Those are the same makers, uh, Digital Eclipse. And so now they're titling them as the Gold Star, Gold Master Series. And this one is number one, and then they just came out with the Jeff Minter story, which is number two. I guess Atari is zero. It specifically targets the player ship. The player can put a temporary shield that causes enemies to bounce off them. Then you can even look at the disc. Look, look at that. The actual digitized scanned disc. So here, before Karataka, Jordan created this arcade style shoot 'em up known as Death Bounce. This was the first playable prototype. Quote, I took it down to the computer store on Temple Street to see it in color. Jordan wrote in his journal on April 28, 1982. It was so beautiful, words cannot describe. The people in the store were very enthusiastic. The first version of Death Bounce was pure gameplay, no story, no or characters. 
with a stark clean look inspired by popular arcade shooting games. No, prototypes represent unfinished work and may contain bugs or other unintended behavior. Oh, okay. So, this is the, the actual game. Where's my ship? Oh, shit. Oh, there you go. Can I move? Oh, yes, I can. Oh, wow, I'm really like, oh, okay, there's my shield. What a fire. I can't fire with the shield on? Oh, shit. I died, but... God, <laughs> each one, I, every time I shoot the last one, I get killed by the last one. Well, not that time. Oh, game over. <laughs> Let's try it again. Let me try it. I wasn't expecting. Oh, there we go. Good. Oh, shit. I should have just stayed, stayed still. Shit, 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 shit. Just stay still. <laughs> stay in your zone. Stay in your lane. I mean, it is very much like asteroids. Um, I don't have 64, any Nintendo 64 games anymore. But I have the Super Nintendo. I mean, I have it on ROMs on my computer, an emulation, but... I have an actual physical copy of the Star Fox for the Super Nintendo, the first one. <laughs> White balls going around in circles. Which I, you know, I mean, I haven't got around to collecting N64 games. I don't know if I will. But yeah, I would, I would definitely get that. That would probably be the first one I, I would get. So that's Death Bounce. Which is cool. Here's a broad run letter from Jordan Mechner to Doug Carlson, CEO of Rotor, accompanying the Death Bounce text. Jordan wrote this letter on the same day he finished the first version of Death Bounce. He didn't have a color monitor in his dorm room, so he had to verify the colors at his local computer store. Now that's cool that, you know, he saved all this shit. You know. Yeah, that's right. Yep. I have that version on my computer also. That's Mouse version two. Jordan began to work on a new version of Death Bounce on June 1st, 1982. On June 4th, he turned 18. On June 15th, he mailed the new version to Broader Bun. I know I still don't know how to say that. The rover ball was now a wedge shape. An on screen power gauge now showed your remaining shield energy, and the balls now cycled through a series of colors before disintegrating. Oh. Up Star Wars The Old Republic. I have that too. I should re download it and try it now that I got a decent computer. Oh shit, died right away. Seven is awesome. Oh, what's this no thing? Oh, that's that, that ball, that white ball. What's the shield? Oh, it does have a, well, it does have a bar. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, turn off. At last, what you've never seen, never heard, never felt in a video game. Star Master. Oh, the Atari right. video yeah, I don't have my bot on. I don't know how many times I have to repeat that. <laughs> but wait. Fight and fight again. Retreat to refuel. Battle and be blasted right out of your senses. Star Master by Activision.
division. Another letter. They're explaining the differences in this new version of the game. They're from Broader Bund. All right, Carl. Carlston's impressions of the new prototype he suggests that Mechner add joystick support, cartoon style animation with identifiable little creatures, and a new element that get introduced as the player progresses through the levels. He also suggested that Jordan consider creating an Apple version of an in-development game called Tiny Planets. Okay. Star Wars Battlefront 2. I recently got a code for the Battlefront Classic Edition, but I heard it's... I don't know. They should have fixed by now, you think? Servers? The description of the game, Rotterbund wanted Jordan to program for the Apple II. It's yet another play on asteroids, only this time the player can land on the different asteroids, and a, and a tiny person can jump out of the ship and collect gold nuggets on their surfaces player can then fly to the intergalactic bank to deposit their cash. Jordan declined to create the game. Death Bounce version 3. Oh, wow. On August 4th, 1982, Jordan finished a third version of Death Bounce, adding elements based on Carlson's suggestion. A joystick option, more animation of the bouncing balls, and a little man re resembling the people in on game Choplifter, who, claim, who climbs in and out of the spaceship. Oh. All right. All right, that's all. <laughs> a different... Oh, there's a little guy down there. Look at that. Getting in the ship. That's kind of neat. Your concert and be the audience. Under a Bret Hart sharpshooter for four minutes. Um, can I do both? <laughs> I mean, I don't care. I mean, you know, Taylor ain't bad on the eyes, so. You know. And are we talking Bret Hart today? Because that hole probably won't have much strength behind it. <laughs> I don't know, that shit could be pro pretty painful. Remember who his dad is. God, you know, that's just really... The thrust really has some get up and go there. Oh, he's... <laughs> now, Peak Hitman, yeah. I, I'd probably go watch... Uh, Taylor, <laughs> I don't. I want no part of the sub, the sharpshooter. All right, well, there you go. There is. Letter from Jordan Carlson explaining the features of the new Death Bounce version. He notes that he appended a proposed storyline to explain what the player is doing in a spaceship bouncing around, shooting things. Not about manual. The year is six. 6412, Jordan's attempt at writing a fairly elaborate scenario for the third version of Death Bounce, including the rules of the game and new joystick-based control scheme. Jordan's journals, Carlston said, among the other things, the game is one, too monotonous, two, too hard at first, and three, too much straight shoot 'em up without making much sense of maneuvering which is the best feature, and four, too visually boring. I agree on all accounts. Nice now. Skipping class making games. Jordan Mechner was a, an undergraduate at the prestigious Yale University when he created Death Bounce and Karateka, but his obsession with perfecting his gem, games, gems, <laughs> he had a lot of trouble keeping up with his studies. Oops. Jordan was from a different world when I met him. I don't think I ever heard a single college-related story from him. He was in a different world. I think college was just a place he lived. At least that's the impression that he gave. What did you think about 
me making games. The fact that I was in college, but I was taking my computer well, with me and spending most of my time on these games. You know, I always encouraged everything you wanted to do. <laughs> I, I was indiscriminate. <laughs> That's true. I don't remember you ever trying to discourage me no. or telling me that I should yeah. focus on my studies. Or... In our family, that works, that's what works best. People follow their passions, and that usually leads to a good result. And so Jordan was this really, like his father played Go, his father played chess, his, it's just a very intellectual background. And yet Jordan was so into pop culture. Jordan loved all of the movies that had come out, Star Wars and, and Indiana Jones and all of those other movies, and also classics of cinema. So he was well-versed in all of it. So he's this intellectual, like consummate intellectual, but is super into, into uh, pop art forms as well. And I think Jordan managed to sort of gain <laughs> control of his life and, you know, everything else. Ten sort of minutes, away man, you're brave. His studies and everything he started, he started forgetting about. I mean, I was getting pretty bad grades my freshman year. I was struggling. I almost, uh, I had to drop a bunch of classes because I was spending all my time programming games. Did you even know that? That, that, didn't, that didn't worry me yeah. because I, I knew that that was common among high achievers. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with Bill Gates, you know, um, although I think Bill's departure from Harvard was involuntary. But uh, a, a lot of these guys, they, they're just in too much of a hurry to get on with it and, and didn't want to spend any more time wasting their time. Increased class cutting, decreased homework. Going to sleep later and later, mess piling up on my desk, putting things off. D minus on German midterm, four and 10, CS assignment. At least, you know, I will say one thing about uh, Taylor is that she actually plays live, so. Oops, I don't want to do that again. So I'll give her that. Dance Bounce gets an intro. Jordan spent much of his 1982 winter break making what would turn it out to be the final update to Death Bounce. It now had a story and a brief cinematic sequences. The player now boarded a space train advancing from car to car, defeating enemies. At the front of the car of the train, the player destroys the power generator and has to escape. <coughs> mm -hmm. She can hold a guitar. <laughs> and plays it. I, I hear she plays it sometimes. Prince said this new version that bounces a broader bun. In January 1983, mistyping the year as 1982. He noted that while he wanted to make various changes and improvements, he likely wouldn't have time to do it until spring break in March. Death Bounce version 4. The final version of Death Bounce. January 20th, 1983. The bouncing balls are now eggs thrown by the mother bat which becomes smaller bats if not taken care of. The wedge-shaped rover still pursues the player who has to maneuver the ship through the doors to get to the front of the space train. Is it? Uh, I've never seen her live, so. Go to the front of the train. All right. Oh shit, that fucking hey, stop. <laughs> Damn. Um Oh, I guess I have to fly through those openings. Okay. Oh, look at that. Oh, this is a lot different now. Jesus. I'm going to the front of the train. It's like a boss fight. How do I shoot this fucking thing? Oh, there we go. Well, this is a much better version, I guess. Ooh, abandoned shift. <laughs> Okay. All right. Oh, too late. Oh, I have to do something to abandon shift. <laughs> Oops. Game of. Oh, wow. 
Hey, come back. <laughs> well, that's cool. Not that that definitely got to see the progress. Put Jordan's final version of Death Bounce in front of a focus group of gamers who delivered some fairly harsh criticism. They passed these along with some concrete advice for how Death Bounce could continue to improve. Ouch. Broader March 1983, the back and forth over Death Bounce having now gone on for a full year, Jordan pushed Broader to officially sign the game and pay him an advance. Broader declined, and Jordan decided to quit working on Death Bounce. Besides, he already had another design in mind. Hmm. I wonder what that was. Death Bounce, learning from rejection. Jordan thought Death Bounce was his ticket to video game superstardom, and it was, but not in the way he expected. The lessons Jordan learned from Ron's rejection of Death Bounce led him to pursue something much more innovative and original. You, you did another one, which was called um, uh, Death Bounce, right? <laughs> yeah, amazing. I'm amazed you can remember that. Yes, it was Death Bounce. Death Bounce, yeah. And it was kind of like asteroids, but just different enough to be original. Instead of the asteroids, it was bouncing uh, colored balls, like pool balls that yeah. ricocheted off the sides of the screen. So what happened to that? Well, that was the first game that I sent to Bruderbund. Oh, yeah. Bruder I was, Bruderbund. Uh, I was in college. I was in my dorm room freshman year when the phone rang. And it was uh, Doug Carlston, the president of Bruderbund, saying, thanks for sending me. <laughs> and sent the game on a floppy uh -huh. disk uh -huh. you know, in the mail. That's how it had been. <laughs> he was in college. And by his own admission, spending a lot more time learning to program than studying sociology or whatever it was he was majoring in down at Yale. He sent, I think his very first submission was something called Death Bounce. And I actually thought he was a pretty good coder, especially for somebody who obviously wasn't doing Excuse it full time. Me. Although it turned out he was doing it a lot more full time than I realized. And he said, you know, it's well programmed, you know, you're a good programmer, but this game is just a little bit old fashioned. <laughs> There was no plot, there was no story, there was nobody you cared about, there were just balls bouncing around doing different things. And although you could get away with that, I just thought it would be a much better product, not that particular one, but if he would try to come up with a storyline and a backstory for what he was doing. Um, I did try to make it as much a not rejection as I could by telling him that I thought he was a keeper and he just needed to work on something that was a little bit different. I got that phone call and he said, I'm going to send you our new game, which is a big hit called Choplifter, so you can see what this year's games look like. That was Danny Gorlin, and it was a straight submission. And initially there wasn't a game. He just was really interested in what it would take to to make a joystick fly a helicopter on the screen. I like and then Choplifter. he added a little rescue thing, and we eventually, with him, turned it into a game. A choplifter was, a, a, you controlled a helicopter, and the idea was to rescue hostages. Oh, yeah. It was kind of oh, based yeah. on the yeah. Iran hostage crisis. Mm -hmm. And you had to fly your helicopter and rescue these little, you know, <laughs> eight like pixel so many high characters that were running around game. in the desert. It's a very simple game by today's standards, but what struck me about it was that it told a story. Well, that inspired yeah. you to think about, uh, about Karateka? Yeah, uh, because when I saw Choplifter, it's like the state of the art of games had advanced, and that was kind of a a revelation to me because I realized that all the games that I'd been trying to make, Asteroids and Death Bounce, were really inspired by those coin-op arcade games where you had three lives and you tried to rack up as many points as you could. But then uh, with the home computers, games were sold on floppy disks, so you actually owned the game. So when I saw Choplifter, I realized that there's no need to make those kind of games you know, where people are going to keep playing to try to get a high score. A game can actually have oh, an end. A little too detailed and, yeah, there. The choplifter doesn't say game over. <laughs> yeah. Put your quarter in, it says the end. And so that was new at the time, so that sort of was part of the inspiration oh, for Karateka to do a game that would also tell a story. Death Bounce Rebounded. Created by the designers at Digital Eclipse, Death Bounce Rebounded turns Jordan Mechner's original concept into an all new modern day twin stick. Twin stick? Shooting experience. Oh my god, this is gonna be 
going to be a great... Whoa. Jeez. Alright. So here is 6413. For a long as anyone can remember, the galaxy has been at peace. But one fateful day, the planet's defense system spots an anomalous array of near-Earth objects. Scientists determine that it is not a deadly meteor shower, but when it draws near, close enough to identify their relief turns to panic. Ancient but powerful ships, known to history only as space trains, are blasting at light speed towards Earth, transporting a cargo of planet obliteration bombs. Earth's advanced techno technological defenses are useless in the face of this ancient enemy. In desperation, the Earth's government taps a top-secret, highly experimental project. The Pentagon calls them the Reflective Spacecraft Division. They call themselves the Death Bouncers. A single-man ship silently approaches an enemy train. The sounds are going to be cool. Oh shit. Oh shit, it's like Star Cats. Oh shit, what is that? Put it down, dive bomb. Oh, okay. Sure, I got achievement. That was kind of cool. This is like brand new. If they digitally clips remade. Just for this, this uh, game. Documentary. Interactive documentary. To go all the way back? What am I doing? Get another ship? The giant G spot. Do really do all this? Can I skip? Missed. Uh, that's 
Bombardus right in, yes. Not on the weekends, though. Unless, you know, I skip a day during the week. Cat, do you hear mom? Do you hear cat? Oh, well, I could shoot that thing, I guess not. when you should be failed, JJ. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm... Oh, <laughs> oh. Well, this is cool. I like this. This is pretty cool. I dig that. That was pretty neat. Don't know about you, but I think that pretty good. Psyched for Karataka. Fuck Death Bounce. What a waste. God, language. <laughs> Would there even be Karataka if Death Bounce had succeeded? Only after attempting to get rich quick off converse, converse, con ugh, conversions of arcade games did Jordan land on an original idea inspired by his own interests. So, and here we go. From Karate to Karataka. While developing Death Bounce, Jordan begins work on a karate tournament simulator, but the early concept soon gave way to a different sort of game. Tomato Pie Legendary Sally's a pizza, a pizza on Worcester Street in New Haven was a popular hangout for Yaleys. I guess that's where when you go to Yale, Yale, mm. including Jordan. While another 1980s video game character was said to have been inspired by a pizza with one slice removed, Jordan's inspiration would have to come from elsewhere. Earth's design documents. Jordan had several arcade style game ideas he wanted to work on during the 1982 summer break. And the first one he got started on was Earth, in which he, which the player has to protect the blue planet at the center of the screen from various attacks. I, I believe so. Earth. 
Earth Demo. This early demo seems to be as far as Jordan got with Earth. You can rotate around the planet and drop objects. Jordan initially wanted to finish programming this game by the end of July 1982, but got distracted by a new idea. Oh, this is a video I don't have to play. <clears throat> Origins of Karateka. The Japanese martial art of karate was exploding in popularity in America in the early 1980s, and many members of the Mechner family began taking lessons. This inspired Jordan to create a one-on-one -on -one martial arts game simulating a karate tournament, although its initial idea didn't last long. I was thinking about how, how Karateka got started. He's saying carrot take it. Do you remember how I got started? Well, so I was, uh, I was in college. I was, uh, it was my freshman year, I think, in college. Yeah. I probably came home on vacation Yeah. at one point with this new project that was starting. And we were taking karate lessons at the local gym at Chapel Choir. I remember that. You were? Well, Mom and Emily. And, yeah, and I, I, I took some too. Your mother and, and Emily were doing karate very vigorously. Yeah, so I took karate lessons too that summer. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't get very good at it. I think I was a yellow belt. Mom got, like that. Mom got became a black belt. Yeah. yeah. So how did you come up with the idea of of a, of, a, of the villain and the prince and the, and the and the princess? Where did you get that from? I think it was really Choplifter that gave me the idea that a game could tell a story, and then as to what the story was. Since I knew that the gameplay would be a series of karate battles, it was really, you know, I just turned to the Bruce Lee movies. Uh, yeah, the, Bruce Lee. Yeah, yeah. The simplest kind of story. You know, it's always a series of karate battles leading up to the battle. And, with the, and the drama was, well, there's, a, there's a problem and, and the hero has to solve it. <laughs> yeah. Princess or, also, I was trying to give it human interest. You know? Yeah. Just wanted to wait, wait. Like Kick your ass. Go Disney to bed. was an influence for sure. Right. <laughs> I mean, thinking of films like Snow White or Pinocchio, you know, where you always had this sort of scary villain mm -hmm. who would, uh, you know, capture one of the characters. Mm -hmm. The Wizard of Oz, you, know, you had the Wicked Witch of the West, you had Dorothy uh, trapped in the witch's castle. You know, with a, Dorothy even had a, an hourglass. I'm sure that was part of the inspiration uh -huh. for Prince of Persia. Uh -huh. So then how long did you work on Karateka? It was a couple of years. Do you remember seeing like the first version? Yeah, sure. Book? Oh yeah. I saw everything. Yeah, you saw it evolve. I saw it evolve. Yeah, I remember that I I remember telling you that you could there were great props available if you used the Japanese. Can the goddamn cameraman hold it still? That they could use a Shinto gate. <laughs> And Mount Fuji in the background. Is that your idea? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, sure. Because you didn't know what those things were. Oh, I mean, we had the we had the prints of the of the, the wave breaking on Mount Fuji. Yes. We, we had those yes, books yes. of, that, that of you, Hokusai prints, of right. Sharaku yeah. prints. And I, I think you brought those back from a, a trip you made to Japan in the '60s, right? Because growing up, I mean, we had a goban. Yes. And, and the, yeah, I brought back the go the go sets and the goban. But anyway, I remember telling you about the Shinto gate, um, and, then, and then we looked it up. We looked because I didn't remember exactly what how, what the boards looked like, so we looked it up. Once I noticed the camera moving, now I can't like unsee uh, it. Like yeah, yeah. the ocean. I said that's what it should look like, and you said okay, and you did it right away. Yeah, I remember drawing that gate in perspective, yeah, yeah. and when it scrolled onto the screen because it was so big, it slowed down the animation. But it was worth it. And then uh, Mount Fuji was always visible in the background. Yes. It was kind of an illusion of animation because you couldn't really do scrolling on the Apple uh -huh. II. Uh, but there was this gate that had a repeating, you know, a post. Yes. So it was really just one, you know, a few bytes so of graphics. So Fuji was a static, a static pop. Right. And the posts were like a mask over it. When they moved, it kind of gave the illusion that the whole camera was right. scrolling, even though really there was almost nothing on the screen that was animating. Video game tricks. 
and there are like plenty of spots there where he was standing still with the camera so i know it could be done maybe maybe they were talking for a long time and his arm was getting tired Jordan's Journal, July 7, 1982. Today I didn't do anything on Earth because of my mind was occupied with Karate Game. After talking it out with his brother David, who was 11 years old at the time, Jordan started sketching out a design for a one-on-one -on -one fighting game based on the rules of competitive karate, which he soon named Karateka. Or as his dad says, Karateka. out with David's advice and awesome system using one joystick and the keyboard to control karateka and an elaborate system to determine what effect your blows have on the opponent and vice versa. Caretaker? <laughs> I like it. Jordan's original 14 week development plan for the one on one version of karateka dated August 2nd, 1982, he was he wanted to have it sent off to Ritterbund. That's how you say it. And by Christmas. Yeah, right, he added. <laughs> uh. Animated Adventure, California. August 1982. Exc as excited as Jordan was about the karate game, he was simultaneously pursuing another bold uh, excuse me, bold idea which he called Animated Adventure in the summer of 1982. It would have taken the popular graphic adventure game genre and added an animated character controlled with a joystick. The breakthrough 1984 game King's Quest would eventually be the first to do this. Soon after finishing Karateka in late 1984, Jordan briefly returned to the idea of Animated Adventure Perhaps inspired by 1984's release of the point-and-click Macintosh computer, he removed the text parser from the design and replaced it with a series of drop-down menus for character actions, another innovation that other designers would later use to revolutionize this genre. Oh, interesting. scenes. Soon after Jordan started sketching out Karateka, another project came along to take away his spare time. That November, a local New Haven software company called Computech Teach, CompuTeach contracted Jordan to produce an educational game called Alphabet. Later, Abscenes. Uh, ABC. Uh, it was an interactive alphabet book which animated musical scenes for each word. Me too. I really ate some dirt on the playground. I was 11, so I was probably eating dirt on the playground. Scenes design document, original design sketches of the scenes. Absence, absence. I don't know. To death bounce. This and ruined it about took up a lot of his time that you're increasingly wish he could spend on Karataka. Eventually, CompuTeach also signed Jordan to create a more difficult version of Ab Scenes, as well as a Spanish language version pictured. He was paid about $3,000 per game, helping to pay for his Yale tuition. God damn! So it's like all those three. Hey. After the first two weeks of school, things should have died down enough bio exam, course selection, etc that I can start work on Alphabet in earnest. Then with $3,000 under my belt, I'll buy a graphics tablet and get cracking on Karate. The game, that game, everyone keeps telling me, Dad and Adrian even, is going to be a winner. What if it doesn't work out? What if someone else does it first? Arr. Character animation. Various sketches and design documents of proposed animations for the Karate or the Karateka hero, likely from different time periods as Jordan continued to evolve and alter the game's fundamental design. Pretty good. 2000 bucks in 82 is a small four. Yeah. Like I said, like we were saying earlier, because he bought an Apple computer 
early 80s or even before that for yeah for like 1200 bucks so that would have been like six thousand dollars so three thousand was probably like nine <laughs> the storyline enters the picture i no longer plan to do it pure karate on the mat jordan wrote on january 30th 1983 i got a scenario the game would be a single player adventure in which a lone karateka invades a villain's hideout and rescues a beautiful maiden initially Jordan envisioned the player deploying on an island by parachute and escaping by helicopter. But the setting quickly moved to ancient Japan as this early sketch. <laughs> For an artist caricature, very shitty little. Nah, I know, it's just scribbles. An early storyboard sequence from this concept after the hero kills the bad guy, Dr. Ni. Nee. Is he one of the knights? <laughs> he finds and rescues a girl, who leads him to the roof of the facility where the helicopter awaits, likely inspired by a Ritterbun game choplifter. Early mock-up screenshot. The mock screenshot recovered from Jordan's old floppy disk shows his earliest concepts of Karateka. Your only possession besides your gi is a digital wrist watch, Jordan wrote. Once the time hit midnight, the villain would escape with the girl. The only way to end the game is by committing Harry <laughs> Carey in the scene where you see the timer and the player character about to commit suicide. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I've been working with Drax, creating pretty pictures of scenes from the game, making design documents and trying to get the receptor right. Dad was full of comments, advice, and ideas on my Drax scene today. Very enthusiastic about the project. The Knights of Knee, yep. <laughs> Get on my head. Pocket Watch. Another early karate uh, graphic recovered from Jordan's floppy disk shows a pocket watch. The idea would probably have been that the player hit a key on the keyboard to bring up the time display. It's likely that he shifted from a digital wrist watch to an analog pocket watch when he shifted the setting of the game to an earlier in time before abandoning the timer feature entirely. My working time is so precious. I begrudge every minute I spend away from whatever it is I'm working on. Death bounce at Christmas, Karateka now, I forget to sleep, to eat, to change clothes. My life gets all fucked up around me through sheer neglect. Jordan didn't know Japanese, so he enlisted someone who did to write the game's title in kanji characters. Japanese language can be written either horizontally or vertically, as seen here. See, so this is Karatika. Karatika. Oh, it's Karatika. <laughs> game kind. Well, the game, kanji version of the word Karatika, or any Japanese characters whatsoever, did not end up in the final game. Jordan apparently did spend what had to be a considerable amount of time designing this kanji version of the logo on the Apple II. It's pretty good looking. Yeah. An early sketch of Karateka logo based on the font Libra. Oh, so that's what it is. Huh? Early storyboard. An early storyboard that is closer to the final version of Karateka. Note the similarities to the final in-game designs, but also the cut features such as the villain's exultant dance after the player is defeated and the on-screen text, Mission, Rescue Princess, which was likely inspired by a similar message that appears at the beginning of the game Choplifter, a big influence on Jordan. <laughs> early storyboard 2. Another more detailed early storyboard, Jordan already wanted the encounter with the princess to have some interactivity, but was still working on what, what exactly that would be. In his proposed version, it, if you should approach her in a fighting stance to punch and punch or kick her, she would fall down and you would lose the game. I think if you approach her in the fighting stance, she kicks you and kills you. 
If I remember correctly. But see, I have to get good at the game so I can reach the end. But I have, I remember reaching the end. And I think if you, you know, you have to like walk up to her and bow or whatever. But if you go at her with the fighting sense, she like does a punch or a kick and you instantly die. Or maybe you did kill her. I don't know. I uh, I remember it that way, but I could be wrong. Remember, old. Yeah. Another image recovered from Jordan's volume like this is the early attempt at drawing animations for the character, char the Karataka character. You might notice something of a resemblance between the character and the man in the X-ray image in the. You see, Jordan did not get very far with these hand-drawn animations. Okay. Jordan was sent on his karate adventure concept, but drawing realistic human movements was proving difficult. Fortunately, a novel solution was just around the corner. Oh, we're on chapter three already. Dang, let's see. Yeah, chapter three. So. Life on the screen. Now an adventure game, Karataka would use clever animation techniques and cinematic influences to create a game that looked like nothing before it. But Jordan didn't do it alone. Francis, God, look, you <laughs> so young there. Jordan's father, Francis Mechner, is a renowned research psychologist, concert pianist, and chess master. He also made major contributions to Karataka. When his son was having trouble drawing realistic human movement, it was Francis who just suggested using the animation technique known as rotoscoping. Why didn't she punch her? <laughs> yeah. Maybe because they were secretly lovers. Dad suggested filming somebody by and counting the frames. Mom suggested Dennis, karate instructor, tomorrow evening. I remember the film editing machine we had. Still have? Leischer's Rotoscope. Shown here in a 1917 patent by pioneering animation animator Max Fleischer. Fleischer. Uh, rotoscoping involves filming a live actor, then tracing the individual frames to create animated drawings. Jordan pioneered the use of rotoscoping in video games, tracing film still stills on vellum paper and digitizing the results on his Apple II to create the most like life lifelike animations ever seen in a computer game. Oh, that's huh, interesting. When Jordan began having trouble drawing realistic human sprites freehand, his father Francis suggested using the technique pioneered by animators in the 1920s known as rotoscoping. What Francis may not have expected is that he would end up being one of the rotoscoped actors. Just like that. Working with Jordan was fascinating because he brought in the um, cinematic side. He obviously was really into movies. He's actually tried gone off and worked for a bit in the film industry. And the aesthetic and the motion of Karateka, um, which he continued in Prince of Persia and later in, in uh, The Last Express, um, was really unusual mm, maybe? at the time. This idea of rotoscoping. I decided to try a trick early Disney animators had used called rotoscoping. Rotoscoping is basically filming live actors doing the moves that you want to animate and then literally tracing each frame to get uh, a frame of animation. At first, I started to try to do the animation the usual way by drawing yeah. characters on graph paper. And then, you know, because it was pixel by pixel at yeah. the time that we had to do the animations. But when I tried it, it just looked stiff. And I think you were the one who had the idea of yeah. filming yes. the movements and then counting the number of frames. I, I suggested, and when I saw you struggling with these pixels, I suggested that we just make a video. Well, not video. This was, was a, this was 1982. Uh, a Super 8, yeah. yeah, yeah. A Super 8 of, of somebody actually making those movements. I, I, I thought, I didn't remember that. Yeah. Like yeah right. And you were actually a model at one point because uh, I started by filming our karate teacher, uh, Dennis, Dennis, doing the punches yeah. and the kicks, yeah. advancing and retreating. But then later on, I realized that uh, 
the character would need to run. Like that it was too slow to move in that karate stance throughout yeah, the entire palace. Yeah. So I needed someone running. And so you put on a karate outfit and we went out into the woods yes, right in front yes, of the house yes, in Chappaqua. Yes, yes. And I, I filmed you uh, running in Super 8. And also uh, the climbing up onto the cliff at the beginning of the game, that was you climbing up onto the hood of the yeah, car. That's cool. In the oh, car park. I, I, I forgot that. <laughs> we're, we're wearing, I guess, uh, I don't know if it was my karate suit or... Uh, mom's probably. Yeah, you were probably wearing mom's gi. Yeah. And, and you had never taken karate lessons, but you did the running. Yeah, so what I did was I, uh, I put that Super 8 roll of film on the movie Ola, which was, yeah. you know, it was a screen with a rear projection, and you could turn the crank and stop on a particular frame, and then I would put a piece of tracing paper, I would scotch tape it to the screen, and trace the outline. This came out in 2023, and they're saying and this thing, that footage there is from 2024, so I guess this was tracing paper in the middle of making that. Outlines. That was a breakthrough, actually, in, in, in uh, video game technology, because nobody had done that before you. I mean, it really goes all the way back to silent film. I mean, I found out later that uh, the early animators had done this, you know, in Snow White. Uh, Disney's animators had actually, uh, and not for the dwarfs and the animals, but for Snow White and the prince, the more human characters. It's, it's, they, it's kind of an obvious idea because, you know, everybody knows that real live movements are totally different from, from what a cartoonist would draw. I mean, there are very subtle <laughs> right? rhythms and uh, speed changes that define a human movement. A, a movement like he even a said earlier, he knew he was fucking up in college but didn't really... <laughs> imagined organism. Well, and also there's so many complexities. So many words. Things. There's things that you wouldn't imagine, like the way that you kind of throw an arm awkwardly over one shoulder to compensate for yeah. the change in balance. Correct. It's like when you see it, it looks natural, but if you're just trying to reconstruct in your head what someone does, for example, when they turn around while running. Hold that and, camera still. So we, we make adju adjustments of the angle at which we hold the body, depending on the speed with which we're moving, so that we don't tilt tilt over. Yeah. And those, those adjustments are very critical to the realism of, 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 the, <laughs> of the movement. Yeah, in Karateka, it's very subtle, but there's a yeah. low kick, a middle kick, and a high kick. He uses Karateka. I remember the frame of the high kick, the fighter leans back, yeah, yes. and also the arm goes back. And that's something, it, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that because I had to, you know, mm -hmm. draw that frame and use it so many yeah. times. You know, for two years I was staring at that frame. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning when I tried to do a frame of a high kick, you know, it was more like idealized. Yeah. I didn't realize huh. that the body would have to lean quite that far back. Fascinating. This took a very long time. It was an incredibly laborious process. It took me months uh, to go through all these steps just to get to the point of doing the first animation test. But I can still remember uh, the thrill that I felt on seeing that little figure moving across the screen. It was the illusion of life. It was everything I'd hoped for. It's cool. Oops. Jason Paper, session one. On March 15, 1983, Jordan filmed his mother mother's karate teacher Dennis Holiday performing various attacks stances and other maneuvers using an older film editing service called a Mo Mo Loyola? Movala Jordan was able to display a single frame of the Super 8 footage on the wall of his dorm room and using tracing paper to trace the outline of the subject the film has been lost but the tracings that Jordan made still remained wow Dennis Holiday left in the Triangle Way Sankaku Duo Do Karate Dojo in Yorkton Heights. I I would come back and ask for some a piece of money, you know. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh man. Ooh. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, probably right. Anyways, the Dojo in Yorkton served as a rotoscope model for all the martial art moves in Karateka. I bet she did. Trace, I, I hope they get, those guys got paid like some compensation when the games are off. Recent paper animation frames from a sequence called Block. Uh. 
Tracing paper, bow. That's cool, you can go back and forth. Tracing paper animation frames called chamber. Tracing paper, crane. Tracing paper animation called label crane. <laughs> Chasing paper animation frame for a single it's called down. It's cool you go back and forth and like Tracing paper fall. Tracing paper animation frames for a sequence called fall. <laughs> or getting back up. Fall back down. Get back up. Fall back down. Get back up. Fall back down. Just fight. It's a very sequence called fight. Round one. Round one. Fight. Tracing paper animation frames was called guard. Jab. Tracing paper animation frames for a sequence called kick. Tracing paper animation for a sequence called punch, punch, and kick, and fight. Oh, that's very cool. Run. Oh, the running one. That's cool that he has all these still. That's amazing. Oh, I was throwing this shit away a long time ago. That's kind of cool. Kind of had a lot of these. Dang. Pop punch. I mean, all joking aside, the gameplay was pretty intricate for that. Yeah! I'd be pissed if this game didn't take off with all this work, man. <laughs> so it actually paid off. In these panels from Replay, an upcoming autobiographical memoir, First Second Books 2024, Jordan illustrates his process for tracing sprites from the Super 8 films. Huh. Oh, okay. Finally, sprites. Jordan bought a device called a Versa Writer, which was a tablet with an electronic arm that would read the movements of the stylus and translate them into computer graphics. This way, he was able to turn the art of the tracing paper into crude sprites. He then cleaned up them. He then cleaned them up in Drax, a drawing program he wrote to create these sequences. God damn. Yeah, there you go. Versa Rider. In the days before scanners and digital cameras, a device called the Versa Rider let computer users digitize their artwork. After placing a sketch on the tablet, they traced the lines with the stylus, which was attached to the articulated arm. Ken and Roberta Williams used a Versa Rider for the first graphic adventure game, Mystery House, and Jordan used it for Karataka to turn his trace frames into sprites. That's kind of neat. Jeez. Yeah, back then, you know, that was crazy. An old graphic memoir replay. Jordan recreates the process of using the Versa Rider for those cool sketches. Jeez. <laughs> God damn cavemen we were. Why did I have one of those when I was a kid? Oh, I didn't have one. I was afraid that tinkering with the trace outlines would distort the animation, make it look all wrong again. That this whole technology might be fatally flawed, but it worked beautifully. Editing the images with Drax not only didn't ruin the lifelike effect, it made it better. The little guy now looks even more like a little guy that he did when he was fresh from Versa Rider. Storyboard. July 11th, 1983. A storyboard from around this time period shows the planned scope of the full game. One level finishing with a confrontation with the villain. 
A game over scene would show the villain raising his arms in victory. Dojo mode. For much of Karataka's development, Jordan wanted to implement a dojo mode where the player could train by hitting and punching a, ba a punching bag in the hero's home dojo. Away from enemies. He got as far as creating this scene in Drax. The game's controls got much simpler as development progressed, which probably lessened the need for a practice mode. What could have been? There's an article in the Times about Dragon's Lair, the new video disc arcade game with animation by Don Bluth. Gotta see it. In a way, it was kind of depressing to read because it's like my dream is coming true and I'm missing it. By the time I get there, it'll be all over. Dragon's Lair. Jordan's product schedule 1983. In addition to keeping a journal of his daily activities, Jordan also kept a chart showing the number of hours each day he worked on Karataka. God damn, that's some OCD shit. The third column on certain pages cuts show the Yale classes that he skipped that day to work on the game. He often cut SP or social psychology, but rarely missed L, aka literature, set 378, film study. Falling off the cliff in the first if the first guard pushes the player back too far or, he, or if the player simply pushes left instead of right when the game begins, they'll go tumbling off the cliff and get an instant game over. It's a surprising moment that adds another layer of realism to Karataka. This design document references the names and tracing paper names. I think I've done that. I, can't remember. I haven't done it recently. You know. These are not screenshots of a prototype, but the scenes that Jordan drew and drags as part of the process of working out the game's design. Take note of the various features that didn't make the cut, such as the mission rescue princess text, the timer, and the map at the top of the screen showing your progress and the location of the next guard. Oops. January 2nd, 1984, Jordan and his father came up with the game's final major mechanic, the villain's attack bird. This solved a design problem. The player didn't need to be particularly cautious as they made their way from guard to guard. The possibility of a random bird attack meant the player had to be more vigilant. I remember that. I haven't got to the bird yet on this, you know, when revisiting it. Second, Dad and I realized the game lacks two important elements. One, conflict of interest, and two, vigilance. So we came up with a solution. The villain's pet vulture, which attacks you every now and then when you're between guards. You need to be in fighting stance when it comes on screen and punch or kick to the correct height to repel its attack. If you're in running stance, you get clobbered and lose a lot of hit points. On January 7, 1984, Jordan and his family filmed the second and final rotoscoping session for Karataka. Every step in this process has been preserved so you, so we can see the entire journey from film to tracing paper to rust rights to cleaned, cleaned in-game visual. Oh, that's cool. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> wow, they still have this footage. That's cool. Oh, dang. Oh. <laughs> Dad's moving quick. God damn, that's crazy to have this old footage. It's kind of neat.
Like, can I stop running now? <laughs> That's sort of right there. Maybe that old Super 8 film reel sound, you know. <laughs> that mom or sis? No, I, I'm guessing mom. <laughs> you should be kissing your daughter like that. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It was acceptable. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I run. Although he had already filmed a walking animation with his karate teacher, Jordan had belatedly realized the hero would also need to run since walking was too slow a method of reaching the palace. Francis McNair ran around. Got the family home to catch you. Yeah, we just saw all that shit. Frames of running animation that resulted from the film session with Francis Mechner on Tracing Paper. <laughs> climbing the car, climbing the cliff. To capture the frames of the hero climbing over the top of the cliff, at the beginning of the game, Francis Mechner donned his wife's karate gi and climbed onto the top of the family car outside their home in Chapa. Qua, New York. What kind of car is that? I don't even know. I can't even see the logo is on front. Facing paper climb. Let me get back down. Let me get back up. Let me get back down. A classmate who had a sister that was two months of the boas and he would Kiss her on the mouth. Mm -hmm. Maybe you Germans were all, you know, weird like that. Oh. <laughs> See how Jordan transfer, or transferred film frames to tracing paper with this interactive rotoscope viewer. Oh, he has it. Oh, you can see. It is layered on top of it, so you can see. Oh. You can. Oh, that's kind of neat. You can. <laughs> how much? How much of the drawing? She was hot though. Okay. Well. You weirdos. I had a friend in school when we we're in. in well, I don't think it was before junior high. Like, man, my sister's so hot. I'd fuck her. Dude, <laughs> calm down. Like, like he was all like, hey, I'll fuck her out. Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> I mean, I would, but you know. <laughs> but you know, you're near her own brother. I and I also know a uh, brother and sister that started dating. I don't know if they actually got married, but they were they were step brother, you know. They weren't related at all but since his mom went out with her dad or whatever and they they fell in love too <laughs> but yeah yeah there's a little asterisk there so. 
This image recovered from one of Jordan's floppy disks represents the third stage in the rose scoping process. These sprites are the result of Jordan filming his father, tracing the frames on paper, and then converting those traced images into Apple II pixels using the Versa Writer. Rough animation. Even before being cleaned up, the rough output from the Versa Writer results in realistic running animation. Quote, I had no idea what it would look like, Jordan said of the first time he tested the Versa Rider's output. When I saw that sketchy little figure walk across the screen, all I could say was, all right. That is cool looking. How much further do we have to go here? We might have to stop here. Cleaned up runner. The running animation after Jordan cleaned up the sprites once he drew the hero's white gi over the character. Some sections of the sprites became identical since there was no way to tell. For example, which leg was in front? This looked fine on screen and allowed Jordan to delete identical sections of the sprites to save disk space. Okay. I guess so. Final opening sequence before the game begins shows the hero finishing his ascent up the cliffside. This was created from frames of Francis Mechner climbing up onto the hood in the family car. The image shows Jordan cleanup in process. Not quite original digitized frames, but what, not quite the final version. Oh well, yeah, yeah, that looks way different. The cleaned up series of frames for the cliff sequence. Compare all four stages of Chronica sprite production, film frames, tracing paper, rough sprites, the final sprites using this interactive rotoscope here. Oh, okay, this, oh, Jesus. There's his dad. Sketch layer. The rough sprite layer. We can... No sprite layer. More sprite sheets. Additional animation sprites recovered from Jordan's floppy disk, including the bird and the explosion when it dies. <laughs> comic book style starburst that shows players when a hit has connected, and the final or near final animations derived from the film of Francis Mechner. In addition to rotoscope animation, another cinematic technique introduced to Karataka was cross-cutting, swapping the camera back and forth between the player and, and the approaching enemy. This gave the game a heightened sense of film-like action. Yeah, that was cool. In a brainstorm session with that, I got many good ideas. The most important is to one, add footstep sounds for you and the guards, and two, keep cross-cutting between the two of you. If you stop running, it cuts back to the guard running towards you. Tension. Originally named Karata Kratang <laughs> and renamed by Burban to Akuma or Demon, the main villain needed to be an imposing presence while he had to be the same height as the hero. His puffy sleeves and oversized robe loomed larger than life on screen. Tang. Jordan brainstorms the villain's name and works on the text of the game's opening crawl. Jordan the villain. Jordan himself donned a crimson bathrobe and played the role of Ra Tang slash Akuma in the January 1984 Super 8 film. 
Since no matching tracing paper was found on for these frames, it is possible that Jordan simply used these frames as reference when drawing the sprites, both for the body movement and the movement of the loose hanging cloth. Villain sprites. Various Akuma sprites recovered from Jordan's sloppy disk, both used and unused. I think I'm going to end there and we'll continue this tomorrow. We have 63%. And I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll get to be playing these games. So, the game library. They got the Karateka Apple II version, December 1984. The Commodore 64 version from June 1985. The Atari 8-bit one, which is the one I played in 85. Ooh, a remastered. 2023 remastered. Oh, that's going to be good. We played all these. The Death Bounce. Oh. Veronica Jordan's Prototype. Oh, that's cool. Brother Ron Prototype 1. Prototype 2. We already played these. Oh, yeah. There we go. Oh, remaster. <laughs> I saw a clip of the remaster. It looks pretty cool. I mean, you know, it's just the same look. It's just more touched up and stuff. So, um, all right. So I like this. This was cool. You know, not as in-depth because, you know, Atari was much more, you know, uh, broader. So larger in scope. I think I played a version for the Amiga 500. I think there's a Atari 7800 version. I gotta, I gotta look that up. So, <laughs> okay, so. That's it. I'm going to bed, but I will see you guys tomorrow. Before we head out the weekend, we'll, we'll finish this up, play the different versions of the game. And, uh, yeah. So you going to join me for the rest of this, Roger, or will you be working, sleeping, whatever? See you tomorrow. Okay. You'll see me tomorrow. All right. Glad you guys were able to join me. Follow me on all the socials. Find these replays and many more on Twitch. Or, no, well, on Twitch, yes. But they're saved forever on YouTube. So, I'll come. What? No, I'm just kidding. All right. I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll end this by blowing you guys up in Missile Command fashion. So, uh, good night. <laughs>